it's my honor to introduce our panel. So I'm going to start with our special guest, uh, Dr. Philip Cushman, clinical psychologist and historian. He is the author of Constructing the Self, Constructing America, which is on sale tonight. It's a critical culture history of psychotherapy as it developed in the U.S. And his 1990 article, Why the Self is Empty, is required reading in many psychology programs. He's a retired associate professor from Antioch and in private practice in Washington. Dr. Oksana Yakushko is chair of the clinical program and a licensed clinical psychologist. Her clinical and research interests focus on immigration, human trafficking, diversity, and gender. She has published over 50 peer-reviewed articles, book chapters, and book reviews, and has received several awards for her scholarly work and activism, including APA presidential citations and a social just, other social justice awards as well. As chair, she encourages students to engage with the issues of our time, both inside and outside the classroom. Dr. Michael Sifiora is associate chair of the clinical program and a licensed clinical psychologist, as well as director of research for the program. Before Pacifica, he worked for more than two decades as a tenured professor at Duquesne University, where he won awards while teaching in the APA-approved clinical program in human science, psychology, and the School for Leadership and Professional Advancement. He has written many peer-reviewed articles, book chapters, and has edited a book. And his areas of interest include existential phenomenological psychology and philosophy, archetypal psychology, hermeneutics, classical rhetoric, and narrative theory. So this will be a discussion on psychology on the edge, conversations on suppression, resistance, and transformations in the field. And so with that, we'll start with Dr. Sapiora. Please welcome our panel. And if not now, when? This question, part of a saying from the first century before the common era Jewish sage Hillel, concludes Dr. Cushman's and co-author Peter Guilford's uh, 2000 call for a critical response to the highly problematic effects of managed care on psychotherapy. Now, as Craig noted, is the 30th anniversary of Pacifica's PhD program in clinical psychology. It's also the occasion for the program's recognition of a third competency in the education of psychologists. Along with clinical and research competencies, we are asserting the necessity of psychologists' awareness of social justice. In doing so, we're responding to questions about, quote, the integrity of our profession and the viability of our society, end quote, that Cushman raised in his now classic, Why the Self is Empty, written around the same time as our program's inauguration. That essay called for a rethinking of the whole business of psychology, but quickly noted that, quote, most of us do not have the training to attempt such a task, end quote. Cushman addressed that task and the training it requires in the 2000 essay when he, quote, encouraged psychologists to fight against the trends of their times, including the way of being that is emerging when it violates their sense of the good. He suggested that this can be done by using an awareness of the historicity of being human and its inescapable moral nature by turning to and learning from the historical traditions that have constituted Western society and from neighboring traditions that have influenced it and through them by devising therapeutic and political practices that are in keeping with one's best values and commitments, end quote. Our program's distinctive depth psychological orientation within a human science framework has sought to cultivate such a historical and moral perspective by imagining psychological theory and praxis in its vital and integral connection to the humanities. The program is fully accredited by the Western Association of Schools and Colleges and meets the educational requirements for licensure in California and many other states. And we remain committed to a high level of clinical training 
and scholarly sophistication, but it ain't been easy. <laughs> One would think that professional accreditation stands for a clinical, pro excuse me, one would think that professional accreditation standards for a clinical psychology program would foster and promote, quote, therapeutic practices that are in keeping with one's best values and commitments, end quote. And yet the standards imposed by the American Psychological Associations, a commission on accreditation, do just the opposite by enforcing the agendas of neoliberalism in, com in conformity to hyper-individualism, collaboration with amoral instrumental instrumentalism, and compliancy with the pseudo-culture of consumerism. At least you think that I'll go off on APA bashing. No, never. <laughs> Let me note that Cushman has received a Lifetime Achievement Award for distinguished scholarly contributions to theoretical and philosophical psychology from the APA's Division 24. In fact, I first met Phil at a 1990 APA convention in Boston. And the two essays I have just mentioned appear as articles in the American Psychologist, the flagship journal of the American Psychological Association. I remain an active member of the APA, and Dr. Yakushko has been honored as an APA fellow. Nonetheless, in light of the APA's categorical self-definition as a STEM discipline, science, technology, engineering, and math, coincident with its explicit severing of identification with the humanities and social sciences, the question remains, and if not now, when? Indeed, now, the American Psychologist, that journal, despite favorable comments from outside reviewers, myself included, declined to publish, quote, the article that is the Hoffman Report on, tor on Torture, Cushman's Moral Reflections on Psychology's Complicity in the Human Rights Violations at Guantanamo, and even more, the disturbing underlying connections between STEM and Gitmo. So in light of where we are now, here are the questions that Phil, Oksana, and I would like to talk to you about tonight. First, what now for human science rather than STEM and rats and stats clinical programs? What kind of education can we offer that promotes a genuine healing art, reflects humane and democratic moral commitments, and at the same time prepares graduates for professional success? Second question, what now for a discipline that practices the shallowness of cognitive behavioral therapy and promotes the superficiality of positive psychology? How do we, to quote the subtitle of Cushman's declined essay, work towards a remoralization of psychology? And third, maybe most importantly, when will psychology address the underlying social, political, and moral questions that now cry out for our attention in the face of discrimination, violence, addiction, abuse, and oppression that appear on our streets and in our consulting rooms? So those are the three questions that we want to address. They're overlapping, definitely. But we want to, to try and shed some light on these. They're not questions I think that we can give definitive answers to, but I think they're the questions that we need to ask to direct our actions. Any thoughts, Dr. Cushman? Um, well, I, I do have a couple of thoughts. Um, <laughs> uh, we were and, hoping. And they begin with thanks. Thank you, Michael and Oksana, for uh, having me here this evening, and Craig for that. Where's Craig? Uh, yes, for that um, introduction. And uh, let me tell you, I'm, I'm sitting here uh, really enjoying uh, the uh, the atmosphere uh, at this place um, and uh, the the students I've worked with these last three days um, really enjoyed and admired them and I very much appreciate this time I've had with you and with the school um, so thank you very much 
Um, a, a couple of quick thoughts. One, the title of the article um, that was uh, rejected by American psychologists is um, the earthquake that is the Hoffman Report on Torture. I forget what it was that you said, but it was a little different no. than earthquake. And uh, I'm happy to say that it has been accepted by a journal, and they're building a special issue around it. Um, yeah, so uh, the journal is Psychoanalysis, Self, and Context. It's an international journal. Uh, so, Michael asked <laughs> what thoughts I might have about this. Well, my first thought, uh, especially your questions related to um, the clinical programs. Um, you know, I have a lot of thoughts about that. I've, I've worked as a core faculty in two different um, doctoral programs in psychology. Uh, one in the Bay Area and one um, in Seattle. Um, so I certainly have lots of opinions. Uh, one of the reasons why I retired when I did almost two years ago now is uh, I got tired of losing every argument in the faculty meetings of our program week after week after week. So one of my thoughts about this is um, that I'm not so sure I'm gonna be very helpful mm -hmm. um, because fortunately, especially now, but even when I was teaching, I haven't had to worry about um, compromising enough to uh, keep uh, APA accreditation, like the first uh, program I was teaching in, in the Bay Area, or gaining it um, in the second one. Um, I just felt like there were certain fundamental issues, fundamental s uh, stands, standards, that we could not compromise. And um, Antioch uh, in Seattle, uh, desperate for APA accreditation um, uh, has radically changed its program in order to comply, and which I am uh, very sad about. Um, and with that comes, has come, even though they haven't quite gotten it yet, but it sounds like they're going to, uh, with that, those changes in, in um, curricula have come, uh, changes in the student body who is applied. Um, uh, and uh, as I imagine you can gather, uh, in my opinion, uh, unfortunate changes in who applies. So I'm not sure I can be of much help. If you had your druthers, what, what are the things you think that graduate students in clinical psychology should be educated in? Yeah. And I think we all agree that the education of psychologists has to be superordinate to their clinical training. That first we need education, and yes. then the training has to come out of that, not vice versa. Yeah. Well. The uh, article that we just mentioned, uh, the earthquake that is the Hoffman Report on torture, um, <clears throat> makes the argument that uh, we shouldn't be surprised that the APA, uh, well, or um, certain senior leadership at APA uh, colluded with the Department of Defense and the CIA um, in um, torture practices. And uh, the reason for that is that we, as psychologists, don't really understand much about ethics. Uh, we don't train our students to understand ethics. We just train them to comply with what's written. And so <clears throat> uh, we train students to be afraid of ethics. And uh, if you, those of you um, in the audience who have gone to a CE programs uh, in ethics, 
know uh, what I'm gonna say next, which is uh, they're structured, and they say, the teachers say this right out front, um, we're here to help you not get sued. I mean, that's the change uh, uh, in uh, uh, ethics, in uh, orientation towards ethics and psychology. Uh, so the ethics are no longer um, uh, uh, aimed to protect um, uh, the uh, population, uh, of the patient population. They're uh, crafted and they're utilized uh, to protect uh, therapists from being sued. So with, uh, with that has come uh, a continuing uh, uh, squeezing out of philosophy in doctoral programs and history uh, and relational theory. So at Antioch, I taught um, a class in relational psychoanalysis. Um, and I think it's probably one of the few uh, um, uh, courses in the country that's not uh, taught in a, a psychoanalytic institute uh, with, uh, for relational uh, psychoanalysis. And the students uh, loved it so much that we um, scheduled two others as follow-ups and also uh, had a hermeneutic uh, research, a uh, couple of hermeneutic research classes. And every uh, quarter I teach, uh, the hist I taught the uh, history and systems class, uh, which I, I've taught since 88 um, in one form or another. At first, it was called uh, The Self in Historical and Cross-Cultural Perspective. Um, and then that shifted to the more conventional title after a few years. So to, to respond to Michael's question, uh, there is no doubt in my mind that what we have to do in order to regain some of our uh, in, uh, intellectual and moral integrity is to revamp uh, our uh, curriculum in order to, um, to, to offer much more uh, philosophy, especially from my point of view, continental philosophy and uh, hermeneutics in particular, but in general, the interpretive turn. Um, we, must, we must teach more history because we need students coming out of school to understand um, how dangerous it is to um, manualize, to manualize psychotherapy, to understand um, uh, psychotherapy in this shallow way of uh, a kind of technicist approach. Uh, and uh, uh, to understand how wrong-headed it is to um, you know, you'll excuse me if, if I step on something you folks are already doing because one of my um, um, uh, irritations these last few years has been this, this new um, approach to doctoral education, which has to do with competencies, academic competencies. So I'm a grumpy old guy, and that's one of the things I'm grumpy about. I just think it's all wrong to think about our work in that way. Uh, um, and we can see the results uh, with therapists who consider themselves um, uh, uh, experts in certain specific skills and talk about, and again, I apologize if others like this 
term, uh, who think about what they do in terms of having a tool kit. Um, that takes the beautiful, wild learning out of doctoral education. And it takes out the mystery of psychotherapy and of being human. And so I have these extreme ideas, you know, that I think are increasingly difficult, almost impossible now, um, uh, in a program that wants APA accredita accreditation. And so I don't know what to say about that. I, 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 I very much appreciate your program here. And I just don't understand why we can't have more programs like that. And in fact, you know, why we can't build on what you have. Mm -hmm. It just drives me nuts, really. It's so disgusting. Um, and it's what I write about all the time now. Uh, and, you know, a hell of a lot of good that does. Uh, well, it does a lot of good. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that you've told our students, that we have to keep yes. writing and publishing. That's right. And that's w what we can do. And you're, you know, we're grateful for your voice. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Michael. What we have to do as psychologists is to re-enter the public realm. We have to regain a position of public intellectual. I mean, where is Walter Lippmann? Where is W.E.B. Du Bois, who you know was trained by um, uh, William James? He, he, yeah, I mean, most of us don't know that. Uh, he was a psychologist. Um, so, you know, we're getting clobbered. In fact, you know, we've, we've almost given up the fight as a profession. And one of the things I said in this, um, the, I think it was the torture article, is students no longer understand enough to critique their program of study and they're going to graduate soon, and then they're going to be teachers, and the teachers aren't going to understand. Then as teachers, they won't be able to understand what's wrong with how the field has gone. And then, and that's already happened, really. And so that's just terribly dangerous, in my opinion. And so, uh, one of the things we have to do, and this is something I told uh, our students these last uh, three days, I'm extraordinarily worried about them, especially in a certain way after they take courses that the three of us teach, because then they know what's wrong, and then they're going to really be conflicted. They're going to be conflicted like I've been conflicted, except, thank God, you know, I'm, I'm getting old and I don't have to, uh, you know, I don't have to fight these fights in faculty meetings anymore and probably pretty soon I'm, I'm not going to be doing therapy anymore. But they have to face this world now knowing something about how wrong it is and they have to make their way and, and uh, try to retain some integrity while they have to comply with certain things. So I am extremely concerned uh, for them. And I am, uh, I feel like uh, my writing really, in a way, is always an open letter uh, to my students and to uh, young psychologists. Um, and, and that they, they really need it, given the world we have now given them. So uh, those are my first thoughts about your first question. <laughs> <laughs>
So I'll, um, wanted to add that I um, had a common published an American psychologist, uh, the flagship journal. There was a special issue on undergraduate education in psychology, and I felt like it was a comment about psychology education in the country in general. And they were not only celebrating that it's STEM and, oh, you know, this yeah. is all l away from liberal arts, and we're, you know, moving towards really becoming a hardcore brain sciences kind of um, uh, training, um, and we have you know four hundred percent growth in forensic psychology and a thousand growth in classes in neuropsychology, and uh, there was almost end platitudes about multicultural competencies, yes. and uh, which I find uh, equivalent to multicultural hubris. You know, I'm multicultural competent. So you know this that language. So um, um, Dr. Derek Hook and I. Uh, a comment uh, to American psychologists in response to that um, with title, Whatever Happened to Human Experience mm -hmm. in Psychology mm -hmm. Education, which to me is a comment about psychology education. In fact, I have kids in elementary school, and they're already getting DSMs, and they're already told that there's statistical data about disorders and so forth, and um, it's, it's eye-opening about you know, how quickly um, both children and then how High school students and undergraduate students are, um, um, a, you know, in the way, um, not just educated, but colonized, colonized in their mind into a very particular view of humanity, of psychology, of themselves. And so, um, you know, we use the term stats and rats in that article in American Psychologist. And, um, you know, back to not knowing history, one of the things I'm trying to write is the fact that I don't think we know or talk about history of American psychology at all, with exception of, you know, feels like Phil's writing, because what we learn so much is very sanitized, mythologized version. Right. And uh, having been Soviet, raised Soviet, I grew up on a whole lot of mythologized history. And uh, what was told was right, and what was not right, you know, and so forth. So we, I, I, I see it very much places in terms of especially psychological history. And so uh, reading, for example, I go and I read John B. Watson, the father of American psychology himself, <laughs> where his behaviorist manifesto, foundational to American psychology and psychology training in the United States, proclaimed that there is no difference between men and brute. There's no difference between human beings and animals. And only physical chemical reactions matter. And introspection, consciousness, culture, all these other things have no place in the study of psychology. So then, if I, I go and read his actual books where he glories in saying, I use 600 rats for this one experiment, and let me tell you about those scientific findings about human behavior I found from torturing these uh, rats. And so um, it's fascinating to read kind of the animal foundations of how uh, views of humanity, views of us as human beings, uh, were very much in American psychology grounded in the view that we are no different than uh, an animal, and, and very anthropomorphized, very reduced version of an animal, right? So animals who do not feel, yeah. who have no pain, you know, so forth. So that's, you know, then we torture them away for to understand the human behavior. He not only tortured rats, oh, what he did to of, poor yeah. little Albert. Oh, my you goodness, yeah. You know the story yeah. of little Albert, yeah. the real myth. story of him? Yeah. yeah. It's a myth. Oh, God. Yeah. It's, yeah. And he also, he writes about he had access to uh, children institutionalized in the hospital, to orphans. And he said, Nothing's, nothing was done wrong, except that the things he was uh, saying he was doing to them are horrific. Yes. But we have, he says, it is science. Inside, don't react. And he actually writes to people, if you're reacting to this, you are not recognizing that it's true science. Uh, at the same time, do you know that it's, uh, again, 100 years ago, I've been just reading this, I'm, I'm studying up and writing about the history of eugenics, and especially as related to xenophobia and racism in the United States. And in the United States, eugenics was very much um, a domain of psychology and psychologists. And, um, and so that, um, for example, IQ testing that did transform from Binet's test, and I have some questions 
questions about that, but came into United States and became about one thing and one thing only is to um, use eugenics-based um, kind of ideology to support the stratification, racial, gender, xenophobic stratification of United States. So if you read these founding, you know, their stuff is now online, you find them, and York's the um, APA president nice. and Harvard pro psychologist, a uh, card-carrying member of Eugenicist Society, says, uh, I tested a million point seven five military recruits, and guess what I found? I found that um, uh, ninety percent of African American recruits scored at a very inferior um, level of intelligence. So we are not racist; we are scientists. Consider the data; it is all data. It's all scientific, and so that is the kind of research data that <laughs> was developed and promote, promoted then to actually maintain Jim Crow in this society. And they were the ones arguing against the uh, uh, Brown versus Board of Education. They were saying there's data. And we still have IQ psychologists, psychologists who are using bell curve dilemma right. and proving that, you know, that there are certain groups of people who have inferior intelligence. And uh, by the way, I just heard on NPR, I was complaining to someone because uh, evolutionary psychologists also say that women uh, s scientifically have been proven to be have lower yeah. intelligence than males. And therefore, the Google executive that made yeah. that f statement um, about women engineers being not as smart is really is right that his um, uh, free speech is being um, denied because it is actual scientific data. And so one begins to, what kind of sciences do we have? What kind of rats and stuff? do we have? And if you think of that uh, animal experiments have died down, think again, because when I go on the uh, psych info and I mm. put how many animals have been experimented on today, there are more animals being experimented on today than ever before. Mm. Um, so I found, for example, I excluded uh, pharmacology studies, which they do on medicine. And so it's behavioral studies, uh, uh, journals on emotions, journals on addictions, eating disorders. And in the last 40 years, I found 180,000 peer review published articles with animals as participants. Mm. Uh, 120,000 of those were published in the last 10 years. So addictions research, eating disorders research, behavioral analysis. There are behavioral analysis journals where 60% of participants are animals. We don't know this. We don't. This would goes to our communities, vulnerable groups, and is promoted as sciences for yes. for human beings. That's therapy. That's manualized exposure type therapies and yeah. so forth. So these are the kind of dilemmas the field has to face. But back to, I feel you know I hear with Phil and I have been both. I was at APA accredited program and ran that ship because I was told you do STEM or else. Mm -hmm. And uh, because all the grants go to STEM. Yeah. And so the uh, universities operate on grants. And so that promotes their research. And even as much as they might say, oh, we're interested in other areas, it is bread and butter. It's their jobs. Mm -hmm. It's the money for the university. And I think mm -hmm. as long as we have, it's a whole system. It's not just APA. Right. Um, but the whole system of where the money goes, what our interests are, who supports what. And so I feel like what I will finish is I feel profound gratitude for a place like Pacifica, while it's human and uh, all that it holds and struggles in this uh, time and age of uh, accreditation uh, and so forth, it is also a place for this resistance and place for wildness and creativity and possibilities for other forms of conversation and education. And I feel um, just personally grateful to have um, spaces like this that at least have committed themselves to resistance and grateful to students uh, who are here and in new yeah. students who are here who are also have this made this commitment to, to do psychology differently. So. Ah, thank you. <laughs> well, one of the things that, you know, my students have often heard me say is that I don't believe we're going to change American psychology. 
I mean, I've been doing this uh, for over 30 years, and I've been in many, you know, educated at the University of Dallas in a non-traditional program where I had to minor in literature and interdisciplinary studies. And the literature training was probably the most important training that I've had in doing clinical work and also doing a lot of research. And none of the classes were conventional. I mean, it was hard to get licensed when I had a class in alchemy from Hillman on my transcript, but <laughs> I eventually got licensed. And, and then teaching at Duquesne University for all these years, where Derek Cook is now, and um, the struggle that they've had to maintain their orientation. But I don't think we're going to change American psychology, so I tell my students our job is to make sure these alternative orientations do not disappear. We're sort of like the monks in the Middle Ages, keeping something alive in an age of, of barbarism. Um, and that's a conservative view, that we have to conserve something. Mm -hmm. But then I think about, well, still, what our, our graduates have to make a living in the world. That's the tough thing. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a more and more difficult world. I mean, I just, my voicemail uh, for my private practice just today, I'm being audited again by managed care companies. And why am I being audited? Because I'm seeing clients on a longer term basis. And so they're harassing me. So they're gonna ask for my notes. Mm -hmm. And I have to generate professional notes for them that meet their criteria. And they'll just keep doing that. They'll make it harder and harder to do this. So. Finding a, a way to allow our, client, our students to survive out in the world is important to keeping our orientation alive. And luckily in California, I think we're relatively safe. It's not easy, but it's relatively safe. But we see the changes that are happening in some of the other states. And being politically involved in Juliet, our director of clinical training, has been very politically involved in organizations with regard to accreditation and internships. We have to continue to do that. You know, that's, that's part of, it's not gonna change everything, but it's necessary just to keep these orientations alive. And then what I think that leads to is maybe the most important thing that we need to do is to become better citizens. The whole system that we're experiencing today is predicated on a citizenry that is apolitical, that throws up their hands and says nothing can be done. And I'm not saying nothing can be done. To say we can't change the world is not to say nothing can be done. We need to be active. And in order to be active, we need to get out of our silos. And one of the things that conventional psychology has done since the Boulder you know, Conference and integrating veterans back in society has kept us in silos with the perpetuation of a kind of self-contained individualism, a hyper-individualism that in therapy we get people to cope better, to be more effective workers, more content consumers. This type of hyper-individualism has to give way in the way that we practice therapy so that people can see the connections between their lives and the lives of everyone else around them. So they can start to develop the kind of democratic sensibility, the sense of compassion and solidarity that's necessary for an active citizenry. So we need to do that professionally as psychologists, we need to do that actively as psychotherapists, and we need to continue to develop the hermeneutic theoretical orientations that provide the historical and political context for our theories that gives us the vision to do that. So it's not easy, we've been doing it. I mean, I think I'm very proud that we've continued this orientation and our move to having social justice as a third competency is not gonna help us get APA accreditation. But I think it really says what this program is about, that we can't have clinical competencies, we can't have research competencies unless we recognize mm -hmm. the cultural and historical context that we're living in. Did we address? <laughs> go to other questions. So it's tough, though. 
I mean, we cannot underestimate how difficult it is. When we look at our curriculum, and we continually have to, to meet licensure board requests for documenting courses, how many hours in this, how many hours in that, designing curriculum that will meet all these requirements, and what happens is, uh, the place where we can do historical work. I mean, can we teach a class in literature? No. No, there's no way. There's, there's no way in our curriculum that we can have. But I know from my own graduate education, you know, reading Shakespeare was much more important than reading a lot of the psychology I read. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. If you want to understand the moral character uh, of human life, read Shakespeare. You know, read Greek tragedies, read, you know, the literature that most of our students read in our mythological studies program, I like to see some of that brought into our program. And why we do bits and pieces and we encourage our students to do it, it's just so hard to find a place in the curriculum to do that. I, I don't know, Phil, would, do you find any, any way that, I mean, in your students, you gave them reading lists, and you're continually telling them to read. Do you find any way to bring actual literature into oh, your classes? Uh, I do, for instance, in the history class. Uh, we read um, uh, uh, so a couple of short stories, uh, one by Richard Wright, and uh, another um, uh, uh, kind of a coming of age uh, story about a, lot, a Latino uh, in um, uh, New Mexico. Um, yeah, so I, I tried to do that throughout that class, for instance. And pretty much every class I taught, um, we studied the autobiography of Malcolm X in the um, uh, developmental class. Um, I don't think. Gee, I don't know. I'm, I'm partly it, it's, it was lucky because I've been able to do what I thought was right. So I put that kind of thing in every class I've taught. Um, I, I, I can't I can't imagine teaching psychology without those uh, that without drawing from that literature. Uh, it's inconceivable to me. You know. Um, I wonder where I wrote this. Uh, uh, I started off one, I don't know, a talk. You know, uh, Michael and I have been in, a, I don't know, three panels together, you know, symposium, or um, uh, at APA over time. And Michael has organized um, uh, some of these, and which I, I greatly appreciate. And um, in one of them, I think I started out T uh, talking about how uh, a conversation Lane Gerber and I had yeah. one day, my friend Lane, who's a long time um, uh, teacher at uh, Seattle University in the uh, Existential Phenomenological Program there. And uh, we were talking one day and, and I said, um, you know, after uh, at UCLA uh, in the 60s, um, early 60s that, you know, was straight out rats and stra stats. Um, uh, after I, I took the abnormal class and a developmental and an elective class about something or other having to do with personal growth, <laughs> um, uh, then I looked around, I wanted to be a psych major, and I looked around for other classes to take, and I, I, oh, I took, my friends and I put together a year-long independent study that was a group in which we got to read uh, humanistic psychology. Um, uh, so after those courses, I switched to English uh, as a major. And Lane said, that's, that's, so Lane is six years older than I am. Lane said, well, that's what I did. Because in those days, if you wanted to learn about people, you studied literature. Because it wasn't in psychology. It's funny that I went in psychology and took a, 
a history of psychology class and had a, knew enough philosophy to know that they completely misunderstood <laughs> most of the philosophical tradition. And I went back into philosophy and stayed there as a background. Yeah. So it's, it's both in, in conventional psychology, it's understanding of human beings, it's understanding of ideas, it's understanding of history and social context. It's distortions, and especially when they're presented in the, the standard textbook form. And then that, yeah, right. you know, that is the form that people are answerable to yeah. when they take licensure exams. Michael, where are you? Um, mm -hmm. Michael, yep. just, we were just talking today about the licensure exam and how it, it, I took it three times. I mean, I was licensed, I was a professor for several years at the university. I was seeing clients because I could see it under uh, uh, someone else's supervision, but I couldn't wrap my head around this really strange way that they looked at things. And I didn't have the conventional psychology background. So I studied and got the materials and studied and got the notes, finally took the class and passed it. But that's the level, it's a distortion, it's a mythology history it's a distortion of philosophical ideas and it looks at human beings as if if they're not animals they're microprocessors you know and one of the most remarkable things is when we look at ourselves as if we were in, uh, microprocessors the microprocessors are better than we are and we're deficient yeah. insofar as we're not more effective microprocessors. Right. We're, we're poorly functioning computers. Like yes, and, and see, you notice the perversion here. Human beings create yeah. computers, then we imagine ourselves in the image and likeness of what we've created, and then we judge ourselves inferior to that. And I've seen cognitive psychologies say that all the problems that we have with racism have to do with our irrational thinking, that so many of the problems in the world would be solved if we thought more like computers. There's this, there's a, a perversion here. Well, it's, a, it's idolatry. If, if, if you read the prophets, that's exactly what they say. They say, we create, um, uh, 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 a, uh, a build, we build something out of um, uh, inert matter and we worship it and then we become as dead as it is. So idols have eyes but can't see, ears but can't hear, uh, and uh, uh, that said so that you're describing clearly uh, a kind of idolatry. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So back to your question, it's not difficult to teach a class differently than now. It's simple, really. And it's simple to learn these things if uh, you, if you, if you're given the proper material to learn from, it's for the most part, it's not rocket science. But what um, Oksana was talking about with um, eugenics is pretty straightforward. You know, mm -hmm. um, all of these issues. Poor little Albert. You know, and how the textbooks, what the textbooks did with that study, um, up until quite recently, mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, what uh, Watson said about um, psychology as the, um, as the uh, science, uh, how did it go to predict and control human behavior? Control. You know, mm -hmm. that's not so difficult to understand and difficult to understand what's wrong with that, how evil it is. Uh, so really, um, it can be done. And students, when they're given the opportunity to think, they do just fine with it, you know? Uh, uh, but when you're under um, the pressure to turn out students who will uh, pass the exam that um, Michael's talking about, uh, and that's really all your job is, um, or to be able to function in a managed care environment, or to get grants 
like Oksana was talking about that are uh, something we almost never talk about in psychology, the grants from uh, uh, the DOD mm -hmm. uh, and the CIA, which a whole lot of money comes into the graduate programs of these big um, land-grant universities uh, were, were, as a field, were quite dependent on the military. Uh, another reason why we shouldn't be surprised when uh, we have uh, leaders uh, who uh, collude with, with uh, uh, the military. Mm -hmm. So um, these things that are so valuable, I'm, I'm glad you talked about literature, Michael. I left that out, but it's uh, when I was talking earlier. Um, but you know, it's an exciting curriculum when you can do these things. It's beautiful. It's one of the things um, at, at Antioch, once competencies were um, uh, mandatory in the narrative evaluations that we had to do, I wrote on every evaluation I wrote, um, first I had to list the competencies that they had um, uh, passed and so forth. And then I had a little paragraph that I patched into every narrative that I wrote that talked about how competencies cannot begin to capture the real uh, wild beauty of learning. Uh, so when you're under that kind of pressure, uh, it destroys a curriculum. That's, that's part of what's so wonderful about your place now. Uh, but programs uh, that try to do some of what you do, you know, they're, they're um, leaving. Um, the, uh, you're one of the few. We are, and that's why it's so, you know, it makes us so happy to celebrate 30 years. Yeah. That's a, a tremendous achievement. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. And the, oh, one of the essays I wrote a long time ago about this, this area was titled Obligations Beyond Competency. Yeah, I mean, it's, those are the things, what, yes. and those obligations are moral in character. And one of the things that you've continually talked about in your writings is what is, what really ultimately is at issue is our understanding of the good life. And not that there is one specification of it, but rather that's what we need to be talking about. That's what our discourse needs to be about. And ultimately that's the issue that is being addressed in psychotherapy and yeah. needs to be addressed in our society. But that is obviously not a question that you can address from a STEM orientation. It's exactly that question which has to be taken off the table if psychology is to be understand, understood as a STEM discipline. So, you know, what, we have a program that's in, follows a human science model as opposed to a natural science model that we're concerned with those questions of what is a good life. We're concerned with what we learn from literature, from philosophy, from history, because those disciplines may not have the answers, but they're wrestling intelligently and with a long history with those questions. And if we can wrestle with the questions, we can engage as we need to engage as citizens. Mm -hmm. So helping our students take that up and then our, having our students work as therapists to help their clients take that up, that's the contribution that we hope that we're making and we want to continue to make. Mm -hmm. And I have, I have a great deal of hope about that because uh, our students and young graduates, um, uh, I believe, will be able to develop 
through their creativity and their learning ways of, of um, surviving in this and hopefully ways of speaking out uh, and uh, of course you're right I mean all of this will never be solved but uh, we have to um, to keep fighting uh, and you know I guess it's partly it, it occurs to me when I say that that the it's the process of resisting and creating and building that um, is uh, additive. I don't usually use that word, but <laughs> you know, you put, you, you live in a process, and when you live in it over time, the world has changed a little because you're a part of the world. And if enough of us can do that and be in the public realm uh, and, and argue and explain and fight, uh, the world changes as a result of that. It doesn't get transformed. Nothing is going to get, is going to transform it. But, uh, uh, we uh, we have to we have to live in that. I mean, it's the dilemma that the left always faces. If you uh, uh, if you judge your work only by whether or not you've been directly successful politically, you're doomed. Right? We have to learn how to fight in the everyday. Um, and uh, and uh, from time to time evaluate our work uh, according to whether we feel like we're doing the right thing mm -hmm. and, uh, and to be proud when we do and to help others do that. Mm -hmm. uh, One of the things that originally got me into psychology out of philosophy was the belief that psychology had access to the meaning in people's lives mm -hmm. and that that's what had to shift if we were going to shift the world. Mm -hmm. And I've come back around to that idea in, today, given the situation that we're in. How many people see psychotherapists? What if psychotherapists started to help people under, follow their symptoms all the way into the world from which they arise? What if psychotherapists help people understand how that there's a common good that's not in contradiction to my good, but that it's intimately connected with it? What if psychotherapists started helping people get out of the silos of hyper-individualism and became more involved in their communities? We could really be agents for change. Yes. Now, I am not very hopeful about changing psychology, partly because of the money interests that are involved there. But I am more hopeful that psychologists might help people become better citizens and that that may change the world. Mm -hmm. Because in the larger you know, context, I think people like Chris Hedges and many others are right that what we need to do is, and Naomi Klein, is we need to be out in the streets. We need to protest. You know? We need to make the people in power afraid enough that we hold them in check. That's the strategy that we need to pursue on the left. And that psychotherapy can be helpful there. We can be an, an, an agent which drives people to see that they need to be driven, they need to drive themselves into the streets. Do you want to, uh, I, I was saying part, part of it, just processing, holding this um, conversation, and I don't know if some of you are like me, it's, these are heavy times. Yeah. And then there is this, I understand, very human kind of wish to say, let's just feel hopeful, mm -hmm. and let's, you know, let's be positive about it. Mm -hmm. yeah, what's the good outcome of this? <laughs> you know, kumbaya. And uh, hold hands, you know, just, it's, um, it's all going to work out. It's all going to get great and work out. Um, and I think, you know, it's powerful that the parallel to this, you know, 
know, we have it in society, this kind of, um, you know, part of me feels like this uh, uh, opioid epidemic is mm -hmm. about one thing, is incapacity to suffer, yeah. you know, pe not willing to, to suffer. Mm -hmm. And then we don't want to look at racism or sexism and other things because it's difficult to hear what we hear and to feel the suffering our own or others. And so better buy another dieting product and think hopeful thoughts. And so positive, I, I, that's one of the things I've been writing about is positive psychology. Okay. And that's the most dominant, dominant paradigm yeah. right now in psychology, uh, which, um, by the way, original, you know, S Watson promised to socially engineer happy, efficient people. Right. And you read um, Seligman and other positive psychology, and they're promising just the same, you know, just as long as you're happy and productive. So what I've been writing about is this trickle-down happiness. As long as you're happy, it will trickle down to the rest of them. Yeah. And you know the new book by Seligman et al. is Homo Prospectus, which says past does not matter, especially history, a difficult history. Do not think about that. Present doesn't matter. Makes you depressed and upset. Don't think <laughs> about present. Think about your great future. So just focus, trauma shmama, you'll grow from your trauma. You know, think about great future and consider your own happiness and it will really trickle down to the rest. And so I think, you know, if you hear echoes of this in politics, if you hear echoes of it, but I think it's harder in our education. I think it's also hard to do this work in education. So there's this wish to say, let's, Train people easy and well. Let's fill them with books and give them stats. Mm -hmm. There is something profoundly difficult to talk about wildness and suffering and um, mystery of being human and the complexity of all kinds of things that make us who we are and ways that we fail each other at understanding it and holding it, this together as a community. To have these conversations, to have it in education, to, to know this about ourselves, I think that's hard. And so that having that capacity to, 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 to suffer in education, to have that, um, yes, and hope, yeah, yeah, sure, you know, joy and all that good stuff, you know, um, no one dismisses it, but I think it's always flying to the happiness, flying mm -hmm. to the easy education, what is the tool in the box, you know, I have a manual, and I, you know, I know how to fix you, yeah, yeah. you know, uh, so um, uh, that's, that's, you know, to me feels like part of our, I think, uh, uh, one, it's American social milieu. I think it's where we are globally um, with globalization and so forth. And it is this turn towards ease and happiness and um, not dealing with difficult wi within ourselves or together as a community. And that kind of education, I think, is difficult but so profoundly needed and rewarding and I um, you know when I have these experiences and hold, you know holding this space for it and that's why literature or films or myths they all hold these tensions and paradoxes they do not have universally happy endings that's uh, called the fairy that's tale right. and if you live in that world go you know look for your prince to <laughs> kiss you and wake you up from this nightmare sometimes we live in but you know good luck to you because <laughs> you'll be with your hand you know head in the sand for a long time Right. So, anyhow, so that's that's my thing. It's the other parallels in psychology and resisting that kind of narrative and push towards universal positivity, trickle down happiness, consider not forgetting the past, considering only happy future, and considering easy education. And so, I think that's these are the um, the things where I think it's part and parcel of you know our own human commitment to suffer yes. or, or learn or to be human. Yes. You know? Yeah, you know, it just occurred to me as you were talking, I, I'm not going to uh, call Dr. Seligman by his name any longer. Where are you going to call him? I'm going to call him Dr. Dissociation. Oh, he is that, yeah. <laughs> he uh, calls himself, is, is he's the one, no, Dean is Dr. Happiness, he's Dr. Positive, right? He, they yes. give themselves names like this, you yeah, know? <laughs> yeah, so, uh, <laughs> yeah, great. And you know, uh, yeah. just a uh, footnote to this. Seligman, you know, was first uh, famous for learned helplessness, right? And you know what's uh, what is using learned helplessness now? Uh, the Department of Defense in torture practices, mm -hmm. and that's what Mitchell and Jessen, the two psychologists mm -hmm. who were being tried in uh, Spokane uh, for um, uh, the torture that they inflicted. Uh, uh, 
uh, they they drew directly and um, uh, uh, publicly. Uh, they claimed they were using learned helplessness, um, Seligman's uh, theory, in these torture practices, and this all started when Seligman uh, was paid. Uh, to go to San Diego and speak at the Naval Recruit Depot in a training. And when he's been confronted by this, uh, he's indignant, mm -hmm. you know, and said he had no idea what they were gonna, how they were going to use learned helplessness. They just wanted to know about it, so he was pleased to, um, to educate them and to pick up the check, parenthetically. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Uh, so I, I really like Which is in hundreds of millions of dollars, oh, the check. My God. And, you know, remember, talk about uh, deer rats. Those of you who want to look up, it's, and if you love animals, close your ears. But um, the way learned helplessness, of course, was developed is torturing mm -hmm. particularly dogs. Dog so drowning use, them yes. or electrocuting them until they became so helpless that basically animals committed suicide, which one wonders, wow, the inhumanity of that kind of paradigm. So there's something. You know, to happen, th there's the, the, the sadistic kind of qualities that continue. And <laughs> um, and I just presented, I also, what I write about is the erasure of uh, racism, sexism, and poverty yes. in positive psychology. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. uh, what is what I call it? Yeah, is one of us, we, we just, we're going to have an article on negative reflections on positive psychology coming out in Journal of Humanistic Psychology. So just trying to speak back because um, they have, what they, you will hear is they have 20, two now scientific journals of happiness of all kinds. They have tremendous amount of grants. They have all kinds of handbooks. They use a lot of brain sciences, experimental research, and so forth and so forth. So the way they, again, like eugenics, which is to me quite powerful, promote and support themselves is saying, it is scientific. If you don't like it, you know, tough luck. It's all sciences. And so that's, you know, invitation to question within, I feel Field and what we kind of hear or uh, understand is what, what is what is sciences? How is sciences yeah. used? I mean, and uh, learning terms like scientism, which applies natural scientific paradigms exclusively to human beings, and the, the decontextualized, de-stripped sciences that um, you know then promote it to us as sciences. So, so you know that uh, eugenics, by the way, between 1900s and about I would say they started dying out in around civil rights movement 60s boasted about what I've counted so far, about 55 scientific journals, which uh, a lot of them had eugenics, but they also were uh, uh, psychology of breeding, uh, so, you know, yeah. uh, heredity, racial betterment, and so on and so on. So all sciences, scientific journals from top universities. So I think that's, a, you know, in our field, how, how do we hold it? And then, you know, bringing it to depth psychology, including psychoanalysis or union psychology, we too can contribute to the very same paradigms and the same decontextualized understanding of human beings. So it's always, I sometimes think it's easy to point mm -hmm. <laughs> at Dr. Happiness and uh, harder to look at my own incapacity sometimes to question my own perspectives and how or how or when they might contribute to oppression of others as well. So that's, yeah. Yeah, well, I really appreciate that, Oksana. And, you know, uh, one thing to keep in mind is um, that if we can teach our students to think critically, mm -hmm. then we can help them understand that it, it's their responsibility to put their own cherished theories into question. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that they can do that when they learn how to think critically, mm -hmm. and they must do it. Uh, and that will inspire others, mm -hmm. and it will um, it will help them. It will help mm -hmm. their patients uh, because of what they can do to feel a little more uncomfortable, uncomfortable. which is your point. Yes, capacity. Yeah, that's right. The mm -hmm. capacity to tolerate. Mm -hmm. Uh, not knowing, mm -hmm. uh, uncertainty, um, and to be able to admit when, 
when there's uh, problems with their theory because there's problems with every theory. Mm -hmm. It's also important for us to keep in mind that no one, uh, one some of the, the symposiums that Phil mentioned that we've uh, had were about psychology as both a STEM discipline and the logos of the soul. So from a human science point of view, we need to be aware of STEM material. It's not a matter of throwing that out and that's wrong. It's an and both. It's from the STEM orientation that it's their way or the highway. It's that exclusive thinking. And then that goes back to uh, therapeutic techniques. One of the things I have always appreciated about an essay that Rollo May wrote in 58 in the book Existence, which was the first introduction of existential approaches to English-speaking audiences. In the contribution to therapy, he says that the existential approach, and by that he meant a broadly existential, phenomenological, humanistic, um, was not an eclecticism. It just didn't pick this and that in order to find out what worked. But he said, because it had an understanding of the human being, it could take up variability of technique. Mm -hmm. That they could take up different techniques because they understood what was going on in terms of an image of the human being. And that image of the human being is an understanding of the good life. That's what's involved there. And that ultimately, I think, is what's at issue in every personality theory. Ultimately, it's how do we understand the human kind of being? Yes. And that understanding is moral in character. Right. right. And that's the issue. Those are the issues that we need to reflect on. But again, my point here is that if you have such an understanding, it does allow you, as I do certainly in my therapy, to use a cognitive technique, to use a behavioral technique. You know, and that's not just whatever works. It's that in the way I understand what's going on with my client in light of my understanding of human beings, I recognize the value of certain approaches. So we're not being dogmatic. We're not saying, oh, the sciences are bad. And sometimes we're pointed, we're, we're kind of pushed into that position, but that's a complete misunderstanding of a human science stance. Yes. There's never been a denial of a STEM orientation, of the value of what we learn from STEM disciplines, yes. but it's putting them in context and in dialogue with a human science perspective. That's really important. Yeah, I um, run a mental health agency here in town, been running a mental health ag agency for 20 years actually, uh, Phoenix of Santa Barbara and now Crescendo Health. And one of the things that I fight, uh, we've got 40 staff, two residential programs and two outpatient programs. We have some Pacifica graduates, uh, interns and some Antioch uh, mm -hmm. graduates. Um, and one of the things that I think is really crucial, tying into what you are talking about, um, I have a question about how you can teach this, is um, we have this um, tyranny called best practices. Yes, right. And you know we have a county contract, and the county contract will say, you will run this program using best practices. And that, to me, is like state socialism, uh, it's like tyranny. Um, and so what I do as an insurgent running this agency <laughs> is I say to people, we need spontaneous practices. And I did a degree in social anthropology hmm. in England, and in order to stay human, I read literature while I did that degree, because I felt like the life was being sucked out of me by all the kinship systems I had to draw. Okay. <laughs> and so I think literature <laughs> is really crucial. Um, but I wonder how much, you know, in the curriculum you have here and in curriculums of progressive universities, it's you can actually teach people to do two things. One is you've got the system that you have to comply with. You know, you need to get the money from the grants and from the contracts. You can't just say no to that. So how do you, at one level, comply, and at another level, not comply? Mm -hmm. And so I think that our agency is, um, I talk about myself as kind of a cultural 
psychologist uh -huh. because I believe that we're not a company, we're a culture. And that we're not about technique, we're about relationships. And it's in that relationship between each person and the client, that's where the real transformation takes place. It requires mystery, wildness, exploration, creativity. And so how do you teach your students to, at one level, comply, and another level, be revolutionaries? Because I feel like the revolutionary spirit in me has kept this agency a tremendously vital culture. And how do you, how do, you do that? Thank you so much mm -hmm. for that and mm -hmm. for your work. Mm -hmm. Takes an anthropologist, no <laughs> question about it. <laughs> well, one thought I have about your question, if I may, mm -hmm. you guys, is um, uh, one way I think we can do that and that we do that is by not uh, by by uh, removing the obstacles for that, and that uh, our society has set up so many obstacles for thinking in the way that you're describing, that uh, sometimes I think uh, it's just the act of of um, of. Uh, preventing or doing away with or uh, blocking those obstacles that helps to begin with. And that's one of the reasons why I emphasize history. Because when you can see it happening in one era, you can, you can use that to realize what's happening in our era. Uh, and so that's when critical thought gets uh, liberated and, and grows. And granted, it's difficult. It's extremely difficult on one hand. But also, it seems to me like students, they catch on quickly about this. If, if you can give them the opportunity to do that. I'm sure you see that in your, is it an agency? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it, it, you, you give people half a chance, you know, especially decent people, people who want to help and who care, um, and they'll they'll take advantage of the opportunity. You know, you know, I, I was uh, of a mind. Uh, those of you who know Gloria and Dosua's work, Borderlands, so um, standpoint theory and feminist theory. But you know, there's always this discussion: if one is not doing, uh, uh, you can't do two things because it feels like you lie if you do one, or you miss. You're given, uh, you know, being yeah. on the other side feels also you, you've been dis disingenuous and not doing it, and you know, giving it, give, kind of giving up to the system, and that for so many of us in personally or professionally we have to operate in dual systems always no matter you know sometimes you know there's many ways professionally or you know politically personally and so it doesn't you know rather than looking at it the detriment it's just almost it gives us another language another standpoint and that we are versing in both and we can be fluid in both and actually makes you know that your agency and I just think it's a capacity to do things strong Stronger and better, and enter that kind of paradigm in a, a different way. I think what uh, is difficult is that in the field, the best practices, um, by even its language, um, right. um, um, denigrate other practices that may have not received the same amount of grants, but are, you know, what are they, less best practices? They're worse right. practices, you know? So there's languaging of, you know, different paradigms, and it's, it feels, um, how does one resist that, too? But to say, you know, those practices probably have their own utility and wisdom, they're just not the only thing probably that works, and so how to be fluid in both, and hopefully, I don't know, sometimes we talk about this, is you know, having students ourselves be conversant in both areas so that there's a, a capacity to be 
critical and fluid in both. Bilingual, yeah, yeah bilingual, bicultural, and not be um, denigrate one side or the other for oneself and feel like one's sold out somehow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. let me, oh, Michael, mm -hmm. why don't you go ahead? Well, uh, in the past I would have said, and I worked in community mental health, and I one time was put in charge of getting an accreditation back because people didn't know how to write notes, right? Um, and I, what really worked was I told them not to take it seriously. I mean, it's, you just have to do this, but it doesn't really mean what they think it means. You have to cover these bases. Um, so being able to do those things without taking them up seriously on their own terms. But it's in, Phil, in terms of the discussions we've had this week, I'm really seeing more and more that that's an acquiescence to the validity of those demands. And as long as we acquiesce to that, they remain. Yeah. So I'm really conflicted in mm -hmm. light of your question. I mean, mm -hmm. practically, mm -hmm. like I said, I've got to, you know, I'm being audited by managed care. I'm going to have to give them, you know, a DAP format, you know, for, you know, for maybe for a year for a whole client. And I'll have to do that. But now I'm very conflicted. I'm, I'm going to do it because I have to do it financially. But on the other hand, I realize that I'm perpetuating the system by acquiescing. So I, uh, there's no yes. easy answer now. That's an mm -hmm. achievement. <laughs> Your discomfort is an achievement, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Enjoy. Boy, I've Can I have some more? <laughs> <laughs> I've, heard, I've heard that a few times, I'll tell you. Thanks so much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, so, yeah, I, um, I want to sound a different note about this. Um, uh, uh, there is a person who wrote a book about managed care years ago that Peter and I cited in, uh, and quoted in our article, Will Managed Care Change Our Way of Being, in 2000. And uh, the person's name, I think it's a woman, is uh, Laero. Laero. Mm -hmm. Seems like, to me, it's hard to pronounce. Um, and she argued that ultimately the strictures and rules of managed care don't, their, their purpose is not to protect the patient. The purpose is to control the therapist. And so when we comply, or to the degree that we, can, that we comply, and I understand, you know, this terrible bind that we're in, and that it's easy for me to say this now, because I don't, I don't accept any insurance now and haven't for a while. Um, and it's, it's, uh, I'm in a very lucky position now where uh, I, I have a, a ridiculously low uh, sliding scale. So I can, I get to see people still. Uh, without uh, charging an arm and a leg. Uh, and I understand that that's a real privilege that most of us don't have in our work. And I didn't for a very long time, and it almost killed me. Uh, so uh, I know that, th as I said at the outset, uh, this is a very difficult thing, especially for young people starting out extraordinarily difficult and very difficult for administrators like you. Um, but I want us to notice that, like we were talking about these last three days, that Michael has alluded to, um, it's a slippery slope because when you, it's like what happened with uh, access to in the DSM, right? When insurance companies won't pay for access to, we have to tell them that we're treating access one, right? And then we do, then we do that, and then we talk to our supervisors and our consultants, and we spend more time talking about access one than we do access to because we don't like to think about access to because we don't like to think about we're not telling the truth to the insurance companies, which we have sworn to do. And that we're 
were um, uh, complying in a way that um, is uncomfortable for us. And then when we stop talking to our supervisors and consultants about access to it makes us easier for it makes it easier for us to not think about access to and not to think about how frustrating and angry we are about this and then we stop talking to colleagues about our access to ideas about our patients and that's how a diagnosis gets or a diagnostic category gets erased. Right? And you know, if you remember when DSM-5 was about to come out, the announcement was um, narcissism is no longer a category, right? In our society, <laughs> narcissism is no longer a category. Uh, so that's a concern that I have. Uh, and uh, the only thought I have about what to do about that, besides honoring the terrible dilemma that mm -hmm. therapists are in now, is to make it more manifest, that dilemma, so we can rise up and not be controlled by these uh, organizations, these corporations, and by, let's notice, the federal government which these regulations now have been adopted in, in, these, um, in the neoliberal administration uh, that just recently uh, left town. Um, and uh, uh, it, the more we can be, uh, allow ourselves to be disturbed by this, the more we can keep this dilemma in the front of our minds, the more we can fight against these things. Imagine what might happen if therapists across the country stand up and say no, that this isn't therapy. What you are making us do isn't therapy. You know, there are a lot of therapists in this country and we are silent about this for the most part. And I think that's one of the reasons why uh, we keep losing ground. Well, we should have the one million therapists march on <laughs> I, I'll join that. That's a very good idea of yours. <laughs> Although the thought of it also terrifies me, to tell you the truth. <laughs> That seems like a, a good place to stop. I want to thank our three panelists for your wisdom. Thanks, all of you. Thank you. And your integrity and passion for the work. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you for, for coming. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Have a good night.